that was shown to save lives. And that the non-fibrin-specific um, kinds, streptokinase and urokinase are actually fairly common in Nigeria. Um, but the, non the fibrin specific ones are TPA, retoplase, tenecteplase. They're rapid, widely available, and relatively cheap. Like I said, streptokinase is available. And the goal is to ensure uh, adult to noodle time of less than 30 minutes. Normal flow in more than half of patients is actually re restored, and that's up to TIMI3 flow. There's a small risk of, um, there's a risk of hemorrhagic stroke, which is high in patients with hypertension and elderly patients over 75. And that's an example of successful reperfusion after thrombolytics. Primary uh, PCI, otherwise called mechanical reperfusion, obviously is the most superior strategy and it ensures patency in 95% of cases um, with greater myocardial salvage. Revascularization is accomplished with less re recurrent ischemia or reinfarction. Again, you get best results when you can achieve a door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes. The advantage um, over thrombolytics is clear and should be the preferred strategy as long as delay does not exceed 120 minutes. And it's effective um, in patients who present late, less than six hours, as compared to um, chemical reperfusion with lytics, which works best when patients present early. So this is just examples you know, of, of cases of ACS. In this case, it's an occlusion of the right coronary artery and you see what it looks like once uh, primary reperfusion is done with the stent. This is another example. And obviously I have RCA lead-in cases. The wire is gotten across you know, with stents. So current state-of-the-art primary PCI, again, emphasizes reperfusion time of less than 90 minutes. And now the emphasis is on highly coordinated uh, systems of care with m many hospitals having STEMI on call teams that are notified by central activation systems. And now the, the direction is going towards activating in the field, uh, pre-hospital activation, and then having sophisticated inter-hospital transfers, especially for hospitals that are not PCI capable. Drug eluding stents have been shown to have the best outcomes and, and these days, the recommendation is for access to be via the wrist, radial access, as, which has, shown, has been shown to be superior uh, to femoral access, specifically in uh, reducing bleeding. So for non-ST elevation ACS, this is a diverse group of patients and can involve either type 1 or type 2 uh, MI. Like I said, the, because they're diverse, you have variable levels of um, acuity and the severity of ischemia, which will require um, significant variation in their management in terms of medicines and options of um, adjunct therapy. Management can either be invasive or non-invasive, um, involving PCI or the use of bypass surgery or just medical therapy. So it's important to be able to determine um, risk in patients with non-ST elevation myocardial infarctions. And a lot of things that can predict the risk of death or myocardial infarction. Uh, and this, some of these are clinical factors, EKG findings, um, lab findings, for example, highly sensitive troponins as helpful in risk stratifying patients, um, presence or absence of wall motion abnormalities on, on EKG and imaging as well can be helpful. Um, we have several risk strat stratification scores with the most common ones currently in use are the TIMI risk score, but GRACE score, the PURSUIT score. And the TIMI score assigns one point um, for each of these factors with the risk of death, MI or gentry vascularization, um, obviously increasing with the increasing number of points you accumulate. And these scores are available, um, there are apps available for the TIMI score or the GRACE score that you can easily access um, on, on your smartphone. So what's key is the timing of invasive management in non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And management can be immediate for high-risk patients, early invasive within 24 hours, delayed invasive within 24 to 72 hours, or ischemia guided strategy where you further risk stratify using um, stress testing. 
So patients who are sick, unstable, or having ongoing refractory pain usually have to be attended to within two hours. Uh, patients who don't have any of those but are still high risk um, as determined by the, the scoring systems, specifically a patient with a GRACE score of over 140, really should undergo the early invasive strategy within 24 hours. Between 109 and 140 GRACE score, we can afford to, you know, take a little bit more time. Those kind of patients can uh, go through the delayed invasive um, strategy. For example, a patient who comes in on Friday when things, you know, have shut down, can afford to wait the weekend and be revascularized on Monday. For patients who are really low risk, then you can you can undergo the ischemia guided strategy where you can use um, stress testing to further risk stratify. So here's an example of a six, seven year old woman with acute coronary syndrome. And she got stents. We had an excellent result. So drug selection in ACS is key. Um, this is adjunct therapy with, with revascularization. Antiplatelets are very uh, important to facilitate thrombus resolution and enhance vessel patency. They also reduce the risk of uh, instant thrombosis. Um, current antiplatelet options are oral, um, PTY2 antagonists, clopidogrel, pasogrel, ticagrelor, obviously in combination with aspirin. Um, these medications have parenteral options um, like cangrelor or the 2 b 3 agents like terofiban and eftifabutide. And then for antithrombion options, most of the most common agent is um, of fractionated heparin, IV, uh, with alternatives being by, by valuridine and enoxaparin. This is a treatment algorithm uh, for patients who undergo the early invasive strategy. Um, aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitors are key, and then the use of anticoagulants, as we discussed. And if those patients go to the lab based on the findings, you decide, you know, if you're going to perform PCI or if those patients would be better suited to cabbage, especially patients with multivessel disease or diabetic patients with left main involvement. So those patients may bypass surgery may be an alternative for those. So after um, treatment in ACS, um, dual antiplatelet therapy is usually recommended for about 12 months. Um, Ticagrelor and prostaglandin have been shown to be superior to clopidogrel in high-risk patients. The advantage primarily is in the first month. So patients with high bleeding risk, you know, who have to undergo procedures and all of that, it may be safe to, to discontinue the um, medications. But for the most part, the, what we encounter are patients who say we cannot afford, you know, this new agents and all of that. So after 30 days of ticagrelor, you can transition them safely to clopidogrel. And adjunct therapies, beta blockers have been shown to reduce cardiac death and subsequent heart failure. Other agents, you know, that can be used are ACE inhibitors or ARBs for patients with heart failure or LV dysfunction. Aldosterone antagonists, nitrates and calcium blockers are also key to reduce an an angina. Complications associated with acute myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, heart failure, thromboembolism, pericarditis, or mechanical complications have been known. But those complications, especially of mechanical rupture, are reduced now, nowadays with primary PCI being the go-to option. So in conclusion, ACS is widespread. It's initial presentation of coronary disease in more than half of patients. It's important to recognize this um, promptly and hospitalization is usually recommended to minimize the risk of sudden cardiac death or large myocardial infarction. Patients should be triaged based on the acuity of presentation with STEMI patients recommended to undergo immediate reperfusion, whereas non-STEMI patients can undergo rapid risk assessment to then guide initial therapy. Evaluation in the CAT lab has become the standard of care for nearly all patients and concomitant medical therapy should include antiplatelets, antithrombins, as soon as possible, with adjunct therapies like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors are also being having a role to play. For patients with persistent chest pain, um, IV nitrates are very useful. Anterior vascularization can be offered. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Tayo Ado. Uh, some of the slides from this presentation were borrowed from his presentation on ACS at the 2017 Lagos Cardiovascular Symposium. Yeah, and thank you for your attention. I'd like to remind you of, you know, the AHA's Life Simple Sevens, 
Encourage your patients to be active, keep a healthy weight, learn about their cholesterol, encourage them to avoid smoking, eat a health, heart healthy diet, to keep their blood pressure healthy and to learn about their blood sugar and diabetes. Thank you very much. And I will be able to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Professor. Our excellent talk. Uh, any questions? Please. Okay, we have a question for you from Dr. Gorgi. Dr. Gorgi is coming from Warri. Uh, he's in the building. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kwonshu. I want to also uh, thank you for your last uh, closing advice to patients, to Ross in particular. So I will say it should start with us. Um, wonderful lecture. Um, I've learned a lot, um, but as I, as I listen to all you talked about, various levels of care, the various um, types of, of coronary syndrome, um, we are really, really limited here, as you well know. Yes. This year, in, in the whole of Delta State, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any, there's none, there's none, because we have repercussions to big us for that. Um, uh, I, I once stopped streptokines. The event that the patients might come, and, and none came to expire with me. So, um, as for Altipase, the last time I. I found out from the record about 500,000. I got to know that it's up to 670,000 there about. Uh, if I have a patient, I mean, what guarantee can you give from your experience? If I have a patient and I student with this, the markers are high, and I don't have that. The combination of antiplatelet and the protein, the way the institution of testosterone, or uh, low molecular weight heparin, like Rexane, which we very often deploy here. Does it give some chance? Well, you have to recognize that those are, first of all, um, let me start by acknowledging the challenges that you point out. And to to say that it is a shame that that's the situation. Nigeria is a country of 200 million people and we cannot count 10 PCI capable um, hospitals in the country. And I know that for sure, for certain, because I've been coming to Nigeria since 2015, you know, to do procedures. Um, and several times we've seen patients who've actually had acute MIs, who've had um, reperfusion with streptokinase, but then, you know, still have uh, underlying lesions and then you know, in in that scenario, we can we can still uh, provide services for them. But needless to say that we need to obviously improve the increase the number of PCI capable hospitals in the country, and that has to be as a as a priority. And I think that you know we these things would not happen overnight, but maybe creating looking at creating regional centers of excellence you know, to say, all right, we want to start with one hospital in each region and then move on to one hospital in each state. And that way, the non-PCI capable hospitals can start with chemical reperfusion. And like I said, streptokinase is actually relatively cheap. I know for sure, I, you just pointed out that Altipase is now 600,000. I know in 2015, when I first started coming to Nigeria, it was 200,000. And there's no way anybody will afford that, especially people who are, you know, coming in, emergently. Um, the reality is that acute myocardial infarction and similar to other emergency conditions in Nigeria, stroke are catastrophic conditions. And in Nigeria where, where care is cash pay, if you don't have money, no, no one's going to attend to you. You know, that's just unfortunate. And those are things that need to be, to be uh, sorted out where we can provide emergent Act, actual emergent services to patients, you know, coming in with things like acute MIs or, or stroke uh, and the like. But to 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 go come to your question, I think that you know, the, one of my experiences was that there is a fear of 
using streptokinase because the thought is, oh, well, if you use streptokinase, the patient cannot be exposed to it again. Well, we have to recognize that it's a patient who's alive, who, who can worry about secondary exposure to, you know, um, to allergic reactions on, on, on subsequent exposures to streptokinase. Um, but for the most part, it's cheap, it's usable. I think that every hospital, you know, that's what it's sold in Nigeria should be stocked with streptokinase. Um, the use of heparin and antiplatelet agents are secondary. They don't necessarily ensure um, reperfusion. It's thrombolytics that would do that. Um, what heparin and antiplatelet agents does is to prevent the artery from re rethrombosing um, or closing or closing up. So my recommendation will be, you know, for us to make sure that we stock um, the hospital pharmacies with thrombolytics. Streptokinase is the cheapest of them all, and I would recommend that that's what we'll, we'll, we'll go for. And when patients come in with ST elevation myocardial infarction, and you're more than two hours away from a prime, from a um, hospital that where PCI can be done, then that's what we should administer. And that's why it's important to be able to recognize the EKG. Once you can recognize the EKG, you can administer it within 30 minutes. Usually for patients who present early, 50 to 70 percent of them will, will achieve reperfusion. And then heparin and the antiplatelet agents can then be given as adjunct agents to ensure that the, the vessel stays patent. And the pharmacoinvasive um, strategy is key. So those kind of patients, you shouldn't sit on them. Once you know, that has happened, then the next step is to see if you can transfer them to a place where they can actually get uh, PCI as adjunct. That's that's how it should be in an ideal world, but I recognize all the challenges in Nigeria. And sorry for the long answer to this, your short question, your not so short question. Thank you so much, Munso. I appreciate it. Uh, those are the challenges, and that's why we're here trying to uh, engage practitioners here so we can come up with uh, reasonable solutions to uh, solve the problem. We hope we'll call on you again to uh, come up with some use, uh, critical thinking uh, uh, out, outside of the box solutions to help solve this problem. Um, thank you so much and I hope you stay warm in Arizona. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll uh, go to our next speaker if she's ready. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Olsen, Don Olsen, she is uh, call, call, coming from Arizona also, Phoenix, Arizona. She is the uh, uh, current president of the Edward B. Dietrich Vascular Society, uh, one of the uh, sponsors of our program. She is an endovascular vascular surgeon. She did work for Dr. T. Trish, our trainer, many years ago, and uh, then pursued the medical school, uh, then pursued to uh, uh, surgical residency and uh, vascular fellowship. So uh, uh, anybody here who's the master surgeon here can't inspire the master surgeon if you uh, keep, keep going. Uh, Dr. Dr. Olson, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Looks like I'm your last speaker today. No, I'm sure not. you guys are in. I'm not? No, no you're not. You still, have two, you still have two more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, Dr. Oye, for inviting me. So uh, today we're going to talk about the management of acute and uh, chronic iliocable DVT. So the annual preva prevalence of a DVT, any type of DVT at any level, is one per one, uh, 1,000. The true incidence of vena cava thrombosis, however, is unknown, but it belie it's believed that it's increasing because of the placement of IVC filters. Uh, up to 20% of people who have a lower leg DVT will progress to have iliac vein involvement. And yearly, there's up to 50,000 cases of PE as a complication to DVT. The incidence of DVT is also higher in men. So non-thrombotic causes of DVT includes may Thurner syndrome, uh, extrinsic tumors, as well as retroperitoneal thrombosis, and then, of course, the placement of IVC filters that remain in place and are not retrieved. Patients who develop iliocable DVT, up to 40% of them will have uh, post-thrombotic syndrome, which it creates severe disability. <laughs> so the fate of a DVT, uh, we know, that it can completely resolve 
or it can partially recannulize or remain occluded. And I think the majority of our patients remain in that middle category where there is some uh, resolution, but there's otherwise uh, injury to the valves. So aggressive management of DVT, typically an advantage is to eliminate the clot burden, but also to preserve the valve function. And this hopefully will diminish or limit the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome, as well as the development of venous hypertension. Acute complications of DVT uh, very commonly can be pulmonary embolism and then rare cases of phlegmasia. Um, Long-term complications, again, are the post-thrombotic syndrome where the patients have severe swelling, skin changes, recurrent ulcerations, or bleeding varices. So diagnosis of DVT, venous duplex is helpful, but if the patient is obese, it makes it more challenging to see up in the belly. Uh, CTA venogram is definitely our study of choice. You can identify the level of thrombosis you can see if they've had prior filter because patients don't always offer that advice or that um, information, pardon me. Um, and um, you maybe can identify the type of filter. You also may identify multiple collaterals in the pelvis and see that the vena cava is actually atretic. And so you would know that this is a more chronic DVT. Transfemoral venography is uh, just reserved in my book for patients who are actually gonna undergo treatment. So when do we treat a DVT, an iliocable DVT? In acute patients, um, I think most of us would go after those DVTs. Um, if it's a patient who is severely debilitated or has limited um, symptoms or poor prognosis, then maybe those are the only patients that you would not try to resolve an acute iliocable DVT. The chronic DVTs actually, um, you would be more selective. You know, I see patients who um, have an occluded vena cava but have very minimal swelling because their body has accommodated, they have multiple venous collaterals, and so those patients, you're conservative. Those who have the severe swelling, the venous claudication, the recurrent ulceration, those are the patients who need to be treated. So as far as endovascular management, um, there are a variety of thrombectomy devices that we have available here that are percutaneous. Um, the AngioJet Zelante catheter, the Inari Clot Trever catheter, and then something called Penumbra Lightning catheter. And then after the clot is removed, you can decide if an adjunctive procedure is necessary, such as venoplasty or stenting, uh, removing the filter, or whether you're going to actually crush and trap that filter. So Zelante uh, uh, from AngioJet uh, goes through a nine French system. Um, it works under Bernoulli's effect, so it creates an area of high pressure and low pressure, and then it um, destroys the clot and sucks it back into the catheter at that low pressure area. Um, you can see hemolysis and hematuria occurring with the patient, so often you can't get labs for a few hours after using this. I don't often use this in iliocaval DVTs because the clot burden is so much that um, the more thrombus that you remove, there's higher risk for heme-induced nephropathy and renal failure. So maybe for um, more so the iliofemoral DVTs more is this appropriate. Uh, clot retriever by Inari is a 13 or 14 French system. It has this flared sheath that has kind of a basket and then um, this uh, collection bag and coring element, um, it's a very long system. So typically they recommend a popliteal vein approach. Um, and then you are able to go above the thrombus, pull it back into the sheath and extrude it um, from the body. This can be used for acute, subacute um, and chronic DVT. Um, I wouldn't use it so much in those atretic patients that have that type of chronic DVT where the vena cava is um, very small in caliber, but more so if you see some organized thrombus in the vena cava. And then the Penumbra Lightning Catheter uh, 12 goes through a 12 French system. Um, this has a little clicking noise that you hear um, when you're using it, and that tells you that you are in free flowing blood. So in those areas, you will want to move through more quickly so that you're not continuing to aspirate blood. 
You can direct it toward the different walls of the vein as well. You can use it over the wire or without the wire to get more removal also. So in the past, uh, if someone uh, presented with a iliocable DVT, this typically was a two day approach. You take them to the operating room, you put lytic catheters in, maybe do some mechanical thrombectomy, and then you send them to the unit. You let it drip overnight, you return to the operating room the following day, and at that time you treat the underlying cause. So, um, phlegmasia, the most severe form of DVT, again can be life or limb threatening. Patients usually present with significant skin changes. Uh, uh, Albodolans is the milk leg where the venous collaterals are preserved, whereas cerulodolans, the blue leg, is where the collaterals are occluded and these patients can have arterial compromise and limb loss. So again, the incidence is very rare. Usually there's some type of associated trigger, including malignancy or inflammatory bowel syndromes, some type of hypercoagulability. Um, and historically, the management is open surgery. Patients can present with severe swelling, skin changes, or even venous gangrene. So this is a case of a 50-year-old man, this is a few years ago, who had been transferred with shortness of breath, tachycardia, he was hypotensive. Um, he had known factor V Leiden, has history of DVT in the past. The patient had developed a GI bleed, so they scoped him, treated his ulcer, and for a period of time, he was off of his anticoagulation. The patient took a long drive and then presented to the hospital with two days symptoms of severe swelling in his left leg. So here is his initial pictures. The patient actually had hematuria, priapism, and again, skin changes in that left leg. Here's his initial venogram. And you see that there's thrombus throughout all of the tibial veins, popliteal, and then extensive thrombus throughout the femoral veins as well. So not much, not much uh, for outflow here. And here is the image. Oh, sorry about that. Let me go back. If we can go back. There we go. All right. So here is the outflow, and you see significant thrombus in the vena cava and iliac veins as well. So this patient was taken for open thrombectomy. Um, vessel loops were placed and a Rommel tourniquet was used, and that was so that in the event that we might have to stent the common iliac vein or whatever the trigger was for this occlusion. You see significant thrombus that was removed. And then we used um, a six Fogarty uh, to remove the thrombus as well as boluses of thrombolysis of lytics to resolve the lower leg. So here is the initial image of the lower leg, which looks pretty good. So the inflow to the leg is now open. Some thrombus still remaining in the lower tibials, but uh, now much improved from before. Now, here is more of a dilemma. So we did do boluses of lysis, use the Fogarty, but there's still residual thrombus in the common iliac vein and at the filter. Uh, so decision here was made to put a big coat of balloon above the filter where it was patent, and to that was to prevent embolism. And then we exchanged for a 16 French sheath and then just did simple suction and aspiration using that sheath while maintaining wire uh, access. And so here is the completion image um, with much improvement. So I don't know what type of filters you guys might use there, but this is an Optease filter. And these Optease filters, I think, are limitedly used nowadays because they're known to have increased incidence of thrombosis. Um, and uh, typically, I think they're recommended to be removed within 21 days of placement. So there's the thrombotic material. And then this is pretty remarkable differences a couple weeks after the patient was treated. So here's another case, a 51 year old female, history of multiple DVTs, treated for May Thurner syndrome with stenting in the past, also a patient with a filter. She had an acute appendicitis. She complicated with bowel ischemia and had to have an exploratory lapse. She was hospitalized for several days, actually a few weeks. Um, she was discharged and then presented to the hospital with a five-day history of bilateral leg 
pain and swelling, the right worse than the left. So initial CT showed thrombus throughout the vena cava and both iliac veins, but again, more extensive in the right. So the decision here was to proceed from the left common femoral vein. Um, we went in with a six French sheath um, up with an angle glide wire, and then I use an Ansel II catheter because it has a very nice curve that it just kind of drops down and hugs the bifurcation of the vena cava, and then worked with against the valves using a uh, stiff straight glide wire and various catheters, typically like a Bernstein catheter, um, and getting more distally, and then exchanging for the 12 French sheath and advancing the penumbra catheter. So here you see extensive thrombus, you see again an IBC filter, and it is the same one that the other patient had as well. Um, thrombus throughout, and then we start it with our mechanical thrombectomy. So here's the thrombus removed, and those are the final results. So let's switch gears to chronic iliocable DVT. This is a patient, 74-year-old Hispanic female, bilateral DVT uh, a couple years ago, started on anticoagulation, develop a GI bleed. They placed an IVC filter. She comes back with acute thrombosis. Uh, the procedure report said that she had lysis and balloon angioplasty. And then the patient is followed by her hematologist and she was identified to have some type of hypercoagulability. I don't recall specifically which one at this time, but she um, had a CT and then was referred to me and I saw her 10 months after the CT. So here you see the filter, extensive thrombus, and not much of a vena cava. So these are her initial, oops, sorry about that. Here's her initial image, cannulating both groins. Again, here I go up with six French sheaths, uh, initially cannulating with an angle glide wire, but I immediately switch to a, um, a stiff straight glide wire and use a Bernstein catheter or an angle catheter and then a tapered catheter. Once I think I'm above where it's occluded, and that's based on our initial venogram, and you see the wire goes easily, um, I take a shot and then I confirm with IVIS, so sizing up to nine French sheaths and confirming on both sides. Now, this patient had stopped her anticoagulation before the procedure, which I don't do with the patients, so I had concern that she had some fresh thrombus, so I did do a power pulse technique using Zelante. Typically, I use like 10 milligrams of TPA in 100 cc's of normal saline. I lice throughout that area and I sit for like 20 or 30 minutes and then I go through and I aspirate whatever is there. So this is the IVIS. That's the distal tip of the filter. So the filter was clear, but below the filter was not. And then all the way down, you see that the vein becomes very atretic and compromised and calcified until you get to the external iliac vein distally. So she underwent sequential balloon angioplasty, starting with eight millimeter, then 10 millimeter, then 12 millimeter balloons. And then the IVIS helped me decide what to do. And I used a larger caliber stent, approximately a single stent, a wall stent was chosen, and that was, I believe, 18 millimeters. And then two 12 millimeter wall stents were placed into each iliac, kind of like an endograft, but not. Um, and these are uh, bare stents that are self-expanding. So initial image and now the completion image. And I just want to make a note, I, uh, on a lot of these patients, you see here is the filter, and it's very low, and I think that's some of the problem on some of these patients. So typically the goal is to place this apex somewhere around the renal, lowest renal vein. So not even the hook, the hook will be a little higher, but the actual apex in this area to help prevent thrombosis. So here's another patient, similar thing, but this one with chronic DVT and leg ulcers. Um, cannulated, went through um, with ballooning, sequential ballooning, and also with using the mechanical thrombectomy. But this gentleman had thrombus that involved his filter. So we thought this was a, clearly a trigger factor. So the decision was made to pass by this filter and collapse it. So we chose a Palma stent, uh, 10 millimeter by 40 millimeter, mounted it on a 14 millimeter balloon. Um, so you advance your wire, uh, as exchange for a stiff wire, advance a long sheath, um, like a 12 French sheath, beyond the filter, and then advance your stent within that filter, and then pull back your sheath and deploy the stent. 
You don't want to dislodge your stent and go uh, without that sheath up there because that can happen and then you have a free floating stent that you have to chase after. So now that filter became endo trash. So here is his completion venogram and you see the filter trapped on the outside here. Here's a CT showing the same and the vena cava patent. So another chronic DVT. This is a gentleman that had at least a month of symptoms, um, chronic swelling, history of malignancy. So looking at his preoperative CT, he has kind of like this tongue-like projection in the vena cava. So for this one, I chose the Inari clot retriever device, you know, the one with the basket, so you can go above it and kind of core out that whole area. So we came from the right popliteal vein. We did our venogram. Here is the initial venogram, and you see that very white organized thrombus extending up. Here is the completion venogram with no thrombus there. Here is the interoperative IVUS showing that white material, and here it's free. And again, the central picture is just the initial CT. And that is the organized material that was obtained. This is a little bit of a different case, but I found it very interesting. So this is a 44 year old female who had left lower quadrant pain. Her CT uh, was done and it showed a left ovarian vein thrombus. So she was seen by hematology. They started her on anticoagulation. They repeated a CTA three months later, and this showed that the uh, ovarian vein thrombus had resolved, but she had new left renal vein DVT, which extended into the IVC. So in fact, that ovarian vein thrombus didn't resolve, it migrated. And the lady was very fortunate that she didn't have PE. So this, um, DVT clot is hanging here in the IVC and it extends into the left renal vein. So here is her initial uh, venogram. I point this out because it's hard to see where the thrombus is, but here's her right renal vein. Here's just some shadowing. This up here is the thrombus in this area. Okay, so parallel and above the uh, right renal vein. Here is the initial IVUS where you see this very organized clot going up and then it's free here. So after using the Inari, which I have to say, I didn't come from the popliteal vein. I came from the groin thinking that it would be sufficient, but I had to direct my wire into the right subclavian vein in order to um, advance this uh, device above the thrombus. And then after several passes, repeated the angiogram, or venogram, repeated the IVUS, which shows no further thrombus. And here is the image. And that was really satisfying to remove. It was pretty impressive to me. So, for management of chronic iliocable DVT, once you've decided that uh, you have a patient that needs to be treated, again, I typically start with six French sheets, angle glide wires, just to get access then quickly exchange for a straight stiff wire and work with an angle catheter and then a tapered catheter. Um, again, hopefully with your initial venogram, as you take a delayed image, you wait and you see where you think the vena cava reforms, and then your goal is to get to that target. You'll know because your wire will start advancing very easily. You advance your catheter and you confirm with venography. But again, at this time is when you would exchange for your nine French sheets, go up with the IVUS, confirm on both sides that you're in the true lumen. From there, um, de you decide based on your patient's presentation, do you need to use the angiojet? You know, you think that there might be some fresh thrombus, or do you think that there's something that can be removed with the clot retriever? If it's anything like the most of the past cases, it's usually that it's just requiring balloon angioplasty. And then you base that on the IVUS. And typically the lumen will look like nothing, but you look at the uh, more true lumen and then do sequential balloon angioplasty. When it comes time to stent, I typically oversize about 20%, use a bare metal stent that's self-expanding. Um, typically it's been the wall stent. They have a couple new stents on the market, some that were pulled, but there's something out called the Abre stent. 
Um, but with the wall stent, you have to be careful. It always foreshortens. So you want to kind of advance a little beyond where you think you need to be and then start deploying. They do allow you to recapture it if you notice that it's foreshortened too much. Um, the Abre, I think, is more exact. So I would not advance that one beyond more than a couple millimeters of where you think your target is. And you usually need to extend it at least into the um, iliac veins and cephalad. Um, if there's thrombus that was in the filter, then you may need to trap that filter and crush it. If there's thr not thrombus in the filter, then you can leave the filter in place. You can trap the distal struts, or you can come back at another time and remove the filter. Um, the, if you have extensive involvement into the external iliac vein and the common femoral vein, then you may need to stent across that. And if you're coming from the popliteal, then that's fine, but I don't typically do that. So you may have to either come up and over or else come from the IJ if the common femoral is involved and then cross at the common femoral vein as well. So in conclusion, now it's feasible to treat iliocable DVTs in a single setting. Um, you can consider which type of thrombectomy device based on the duration of the occlusion. Um, again, if it's more centrally located, you may consider clot retriever. If your patient's a Jehovah's Witness, you would not want to necessarily use penumbra, but those are different types of things to consider. Um, and again, based if the filter is present, if thrombus is inclusive in that filter, then you may want to consider crushing that filter. These are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Any questions from the audience? Thanks. Yes, we have a question. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Olsen. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, listened to you. You mentioned IBC uh, content detection. Listen, as one of the causes of if you cover thrombosis, a uh, deep vein thrombosis. I had I have I had a patient recently about five months ago. I saw this patient. This patient is a 72 years old man, well controlled diabetic, uh, retiree, and had um, a PE about five years ago, did well, and um, three months prior to um, this thing we had had a diagnosis of uh, extensive uh, iliac um, deep vein thrombosis. Um, I saw him quite stable, he had his leg swelling, and I referred him to see Dr. Daphne. Listen to me. The mind was that uh, he um, is at risk of um, having fertile um, pulmonary embolism for insertion of uh, an IBC carrier. Would that, I don't know, is, there, is it a wise uh, thing to still do for such a patient? Because it's quite fine. It's on last brain. Um, what do you think? Essentially, the indication for IBC filter placement exactly. in a high-risk patient. So um, we try to limit our placement of IBC filters, and if we do, um, you know, maybe it's patient. So each each time it's a selective uh, based on the patient. Obviously, if they have significant pulmonary compromise and you don't think they're going to tolerate another event like from a PE or that they will, you know, then I understand placing the filter at that time. I, what I see is a lot of patients have it fit place and then they don't have, they're not on anticoagulation. But um, it, I would be very selective with placing the filters. Um, avoid the Optease filter. There's a couple others that are, that I think I, there's different ones that you can use. Some, the Denali, the Cook, um, but some of them have more likely to uh, thrombose. Um, but I mean, obviously, if you think that there's a need to do it, then I guess you have to do it. But we really try to limit that. We only keep it for a period of time if we can, and then we return to remove it. And we we keep them on our radar. You know, over here, there's a huge thing like in the past few years with lawsuits for people who have filters that are retained. Um, but um, that's what I would say. The you know, and then just keep them on anticoagulation indefinitely. And maybe those patients need to be switched to something different, um, other than warfarin. If they have a malignancy, then either you guys have Lovenox over there or no. 
they, because that at least is better for um, patients that have like malignancies and things like that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, Don, yeah. Uh, any, any more questions? Before I ask the question, yeah, question. I was just a comment. Since it feels like it's the only one available to me. Yeah. Dr. Sanusi is indicating over here, uh, primarily Optis uh, filters is the, the main one that's available here. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, yep. uh, yeah. So one of the things I would want to ask you for, for our audience, given the fact that it's difficult to have a complement to the uh, thermolytic uh, device you, you, you have in Arizona, yep. if you had to pick one that we can easily transport to the African continent, which one would you select? So in all honesty, I think I like the penumbra. You know, even though there can be some blood loss with it, I, I find it very useful with because I think the most of the thing you're this is going to be used for people who have an acute DVT. This is what you're going to go after. You know, the ones with chronic we already talked about, you may not have to use any type of lysis or anything with them, just balloon and stent and get out. But I would probably say the penumbra. I like it a lot. Um, it's easy to use. You can direct it in different areas and it's for acute, even subacute. Um, um, and you use it in both arterial and venous. So that's what I would say. What's your prop? What's the proposed uh, financial implication in the U.S. for filter for a device such as that? What is what is what? What would be the anticipated cost for a patient who is not uh, who's self-insured in the U.S.? Oh Lord, I have no idea. I have no idea because if just going to the hospital is the big cost. You know, like if you can do these in outpatient centers, the patient saves much money. If you have a patient that has a procedure in the hospital, that alone increases the cost. Um, I, I don't know these catheters, how much the catheter itself is probably a couple thousand dollars. The issue is the hospital stay, even being admitted in the hospital. So if you can do it as an outpatient, I think the cost would be much less. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much, Don. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, moving right on. We're almost there. It's been a marathon. Our next speaker is coming from Texas. I believe that uh, I'll be Dr. Gregory Master. <laughs> no, next is Dr. Uh, Yogler and then Dr. Mesner. Sounds good. Okay, we'll revise the statement. Our next speaker is Dr. Jogler. Is uh, coming to us. Uh, Dr. Fernando Jogler is coming to us from Puerto Rico. Asan Warren, he's an endovascular vascular surgeon, and today he'll be talking to us about vascular trauma from this perspective of an endovascular surgeon. John, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Um, let me... Dr. John, how's the flood in Puerto Rico right now? Sorry? How's the flood in Puerto Rico? In the it is better. We got hit by uh, Hurricane Fiona several weeks ago, but we still have some areas without uh, electricity. So that's uh, always a challenge. I guess we have a similar weather pattern here in the southern part of our country and some of the north where we have lots of floods too. So is it global warming or global something else? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Oya, for the opportunity to participate today and to well give a little bit of my viewpoint of vascular trauma from a, an endovascular perspective. These are my disclosures. Uh, um, they're not relevant to this talk, but I am a vascular surgeon and I'm also a trauma surgeon and I still do trauma call on the weekends. And that's what I look like uh, when I'm tired on call. And again, thanks again uh, for the opportunity. So the key to success in trauma is to stop the bleeding, basically. And if we can do this in a less invasive manner and we can minimize blood loss, then it's something we should look into. This particular case is a case of a 33-year-old male who had a gunshot wound to his uh, left flank. Uh, he did not go initial surgery. He had initial CT scan where he had a left kidney laceration. They decided not to operate. Uh, you're all you wanted to observe him to try to preserve the kidney. They repeat a CT scan three days later, thinking they're gonna discharge the patient. And they call me because he's got a large posterior abdominal aortic pseudoaneurysm. 
So I go to see the patient, think I'm going to take him to the OR, do an open repair, but both the patient and the urologist wanted me to find an endovascular solution because they wanted to avoid taking out the kidney. Um, at that time, we had available this uh, cuff. Uh, the problem with these types of injuries, if you'll notice, he's got a lower right renal artery. Um, and the options for a patient with an 18 or 20 millimeter aorta were either to put an iliac limb uh, 70 uh, millimeters long or use an aortic cuff. So this is actually an older cuff. This was the last one they had in Latin America at that time. This was an anorex, 20 by 40 millimeters. And it worked perfectly well in this case. And uh, we were able to manage this patient in that way, uh, save his kidney, and he's done well since. So this was a lesson for us in the use of endovascular techniques. So what's been going on? Obviously, the greatest advancement, in my opinion, in the last 20 years has been the management of thoracic aortic injuries. Um, the first uh, T-bar done was actually by Nick, Dr. Nikolai Bolodos for a post-traumatic uh, aneurysm. So we started doing these in 2011. I finished my fellowship in 2010, went back to Puerto Rico. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. We've done 89 cases since 2011. Usually, if you have a trauma center that's busy with more than 1,000 admissions, about 1% of your admissions will have an aortic injury. So for us, that's about 10 to 12 a year. Um, before I got there, we had a cardiothoracic surgeon who did some of these cases. He didn't operate everybody. He had excellent results, uh, no mortalities. But in 20 years, uh, he had 23 cases. In 10 years or so, we've had 89 cases because we don't exclude patients. Only two cases since we began the program have needed open repair because they were both pediatric patients. So that's, this has been a huge shift, uh, change in management. And currently, we do not even have a cardiothoracic surgeon at the University of Puerto Rico. So all these patients get endovascular repairs. An extension of this has been the management of great vessel injuries, axillary subclavian injuries, which in order to get an open exposure, you might need a thoracotomy, a median sternotomy, or a combination of both with an infraclavicular incision. And this actually has uh, a significant morbidity attached. You can uh, have injury to the adjacent nerves, uh, air embolism from the vein, et cetera. So these we've managed with uh, the patients who are stable. Now the patients who come bleeding from the wound uh, in an endovascular fashion. Even transections, we, we do by a combined approach, via femoral and brachial approach, we're able to bridge the gap using a technique similar to what Dr. Uh, uh, Coleman described, uh, using a stiff uh, glide wire and an angled tapered catheter, um, and a combination of both. So we've had good success with the management of axillus of clavian injuries with uh, the vascular techniques. For the abdominal aorta, usually if there's adjacent in, uh, additional injuries, we'll do open uh, procedures. But in certain cases, like the one I just showed, we can consider uh, endovascular techniques. For extremities, open repair is still the gold standard. Have I used endografts in extremities? Yes, but in very limited cases, usually older patients uh, with limited uh, uh, issues, because we have a concern about patency, especially in young patients. But something that has helped uh, getting these patients to the hospital is they use a tourniquet and stop the bleed. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. We've also started looking into our experience on penetrating arterial injuries managed with endovascular techniques, because we actually have a series of about uh, 15 cases in different uh, arterial beds with uh, arterial uh, penetrating injuries, which, which mounted in an endovascular fashion. And Reboa, which is something I want to talk about uh, first, this is resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. The acronym is, uh, is Reboa. This came about uh, after the experience using CODA balloons and 12 French sheaths to control or stop bleeding in ruptured triple A's. So there's actually an FDA-approved device, uh, the ER Rebo catheter. It's a seven French catheter. It's got a nitinol core, so it, it's not. It doesn't have a. It doesn't use a wire. It's got a, a nitinol wire inside and an atraumatic tip, and you can inflate that up either in the abdominal aorta for pelvic bleeding or in the descending uh, thoracic aorta for abdominal sources of bleeding. If this uh, particular catheter has an arterial monitoring line, so when you occlude the aorta, you can monitor above the balloon. There's actually now a newer device, the Cobra OS catheter. It's a four French device. 
Uh, it's similar, but it does not have the arterial line uh, monitoring. So you'll have to have a separate arterial line. This has been a little bit controversial in the literature. There's big proponents of Reboa. There's people who speak against it. We have used it at our center with good success and minimal complications. Uh, and there's even applications for other types of injuries, uh, other types of pathologies apart from trauma. We uh, had a case recently where an older uh, female patient underwent a nephrectomy. Uh, there was an avulsion uh, of the renal vein of the cava. Uh, they called one of our surgeons. She was able to put up the, cath the balloon catheter, inflate it, control the bleeding, and then be able to deal with the injury. Uh, in terms of complications, there can be some. Uh, remember, the longer you inflate the balloon, the higher the risk of reperfusion. So we recommend just inflating for 20 minutes. If you need longer than doing partial uh, reboa, either deflating the balloon or uh, inflating and deflating sequentially. Um, but it, it is a great tool to have for these cases. So I'm from Puerto Rico, it's a small island in the Caribbean. Uh, it's been a U.S. territory since 1898. Uh, we have the same regulations as the United States, everything, the FDA, all the uh, accreditation, American Board of Surgery, LCME, ACGME, et cetera. We have 3.2 million people and only one trauma center for Puerto Rico and the adjacent islands. So it's a pretty busy center. Uh, this is where I work. It's a complex of uh, several hospitals, including the trauma center, the university hospital, oncologic hospital, pediatric hospital, San Juan City Hospital, cardiovascular center, and the medical school for the University of Puerto Rico. And this is our trauma center. It's a state designated level one, uh, which serves Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, usually between uh, 1,400, 1,500 missions per year. Before I got there, there were no aortic endovascular procedures performed at the center. So we had to start from scratch. I started doing cases in the IR suite, which had great imaging, but I had difficulty getting help. Usually just a resident and myself, nobody helped us with instrumentation with uh, when we were doing cut downs or using wires. We had limited access because it was used by neurointerventional service and uh, interventional radiology. So it was very challenging. Um, at that time, when I started, the first case we did was a descending thoracic aortic injury from a gunshot wound, a pseudoaneurysm, on January 5, 2011. Now we've moved, we then did cases in a cath lab at the cardiovascular center, and now at a hybrid OR at the cardiovascular center. Um, the center has six ORs, they have one hybrid suite, and now we have a second one, which should be done pretty soon. Uh, there are obvious advantages to having a hybrid OR, better imaging. The team is uh, now very well trained uh, in the procedures. The problem is it's a little bit of a distance from the trauma center. They have a different blood bank. So if your patient has other injuries, which requires uh, giving blood, that can be an issue. And now it's being used more and more for other procedures, such as TAVI, mitral clips, et cetera. So access can be a problem now. I do a cut down uh, on the side I deliver the endograft and then a percutaneous puncture for the pigtail, usually either femoral or brachial, usually left brachial. And then I repair the, the arteriotomy sites. I'll just share a case with you that illustrates several uh, important topics. This is a 40 year old male involved in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, he had multiple uh, traumatic injuries, had trauma with a hemorrhagic contusion, bilateral orbitor fractures, tension pneumothorax, a sternal fracture, a blunt, a grade three aortic injury, a lung contusion, a grade one liver laceration, an extraperitoneal bladder rupture, and a left hip dislocation. I was actually a trauma surgeon on call when the patient came in. Uh, we had tried to reduce the fracture. We're not successful. We called orthopedics, uh, but we took the patient to a CT scan before. This is not usually how it's done. You can see here the dislocation, the bladder rupture, and here you can see the aortic injury. You lose the circular shape of the aorta. It's actually a pseudoaneurysm, and there's some flaps and some thrombus with a periaortic hematoma, which you can notice on the image to your right. There is something interesting in this patient's anatomy. Here on the left, you can see the left common carotid and a small vessel coming up the aorta, and then the subclavian. And you can see it, it, this is a bad injury. This is not one we wait a couple of days. This is one we'll take to the OR pretty soon. And he had about approximately one centimeter of distance from the left uh, subclavian to the injury. Uh, this is important. I stopped early on, maybe even my first year, using two centimeters as landing zone, like we do for aneurysms. For aortic injuries, you can use one centimeter safely. That way, you end up covering left subclavians. Uh, we covered about 30% of our subclavians uh, initially. 
uh, but when we can, we try to preserve it. So in this particular case, it's very important to preserve the subclavian because that vessel we saw was an isolated left vertebral artery coming up the aorta. That's what usually will supply the left arm if you cover the subclavian origin. So in terms of planning, he had a bovine type arch. We mentioned the isolated left vertebral artery. Uh, those are the diameters. He had good access. That wasn't an issue. Uh, the issue was the use of heparin with a head trauma. We want it when there are several important injuries or head bleeding or, or bleeding from anywhere else, we'll, we'll do not use heparin. And what would happen if we cover the subclavian? Do we need to do a carotid subclavian bypass? The SBS actual guidelines state that you should revascularize. However, most of us don't. And I have not had any issue with arm ischemia or strokes when covering the subclavian. So those actual guidelines by the SBS are actually under revision right now. So these are the images. You can see the bovine anatomy. You can see we have actually a favorable bend, a really horizontal landing zone uh, proximal to the injury. We're able to get the endograft. And what I do here is a little different. Most people would just deploy there if you're going to cover the subclavian. What I do is I open up the endograft, make sure I have an apposition of the first two stents in the lesser curvature, and then I'll actually pull back and twist a little bit so it lands oblique not truly perpendicular, so I can try to preserve the subclavian kind of like you see in this image right here. We haven't lost uh, our purchase on the lesser curvature. We've excluded the injury and we've preserved the left subclavian, which was important in this case. We get follow-up CTAs. If you look at the literature, most complications will happen within the first year or the first two years. I think it's in our experience within the first year. So it's important to follow up during that first year. Afterwards, we've had more than 10 years experience now. We see the patients every year, but we do not get CT scans every year if there's no issues. We'll get a chest x-ray. It's different from when you're following EVARS in the aorta where you can use ultrasound. It's a little more challenging in the chest. Um, and now I want to switch a little bit. Uh, we talked about extremity injuries. There hasn't been much of change in the treatment of extremity arterial injuries. It's the same uh, open technique we've used since I was a resident. But there has been a, a change that has allowed more patients to get to the hospital. And in terms of pre-hospital management, this is what I want to uh, talk about is to stop the bleed. This is a course by the American College of Surgeons. This is not a course for physicians. It's a course for everybody, for lay people. To be able to teach bystanders to do something, to stop bleeding and save a life so the patient can get to the hospital. This is an initiative by the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, which I'm the vice chair for the Puerto Rico COT and several other organizations. Why is this important? Because the number one cause of death after injury is bleeding, and it's usually preventable uh, uh, deaths that we're talking about. So anybody can use this course uh, because unfortunately we've seen uh, uh, geographic uh, ecological disasters, storms, earthquakes, like we've had uh, several couple of years, and anything can happen. So the goals on the course are to identify uh, life-threatening bleeding and to do something about it, either hold pressure, if it's a deeper wound, pack and hold pressure, or use a tourniquet. It's got ABCs, and it's really simple. Alert, call your 911 or your emergency medical services because you're holding pressure and nobody comes back to help you. You're going to be there a while. Then stop the bleeding, uh, identify the bleeding, and then stop it. This is actually a patient who came to our center with, uh, this was not uh, my incision for exposure. This is actually what the wound was. He had a electric saw and he had transected his uh, radial artery. So the exposure was made for me. He actually helped pressure that helped the two uh, stumps of the radial artery to close off of the thrombose. And I was able to take him and do a, a, a direct repair. So this was possible because he actually held pressure. Otherwise, he could have bled out and never made it to the hospital for a very simple repair from a vascular point of view. Their tourniquet is commercially available. The most common is the, the CAT, the combat, combat application tourniquet. They all work. Uh, there hasn't been cases of reported limb loss with tourniquets placed less than two hours. So they save lives. These are the patients that we usually get is patients with motorcycle injuries, and uh, near complete or traumatic amputations where the tourniquet helps stop the bleeding before we take the patient to the OR. So if you want more information about this, I recommend you go to stopthebleed.org. It's got information about courses. It's got information about obtaining tourniquets and uh, bleeding control equipment. So we teach this to our medical students. I'm a career clerkship director since 2017 after Maria, after the big hurricane. 
every medical student from the University of Puerto Rico during their surgery rotation, they take the course. This is obviously before the pandemic. Uh, in January, 2020, we had a big earthquake in Puerto Rico. So I got calls from schools. So I went to teach uh, educators, teachers, students uh, on bleeding control techniques. And then during the pandemic, the first course we gave was in June. Uh, nobody got COVID. Uh, we took precautions, but we kept this going. So we taught several thousand people. We have 3.2 a million uh, population. We still have a ways to go. Because the only thing more tragic than a death is a death that could have been prevented. So with that, uh, I know I'm one of your last speakers. I will stop there um, if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Jodo. A very interesting um, discussion here. Um, any questions from the audience before I ask the question? Yeah, now when we look at trauma in Nigeria, it's quite interesting. It's a garment of all the things that you have in Puerto Rico. So obviously, uh, the uh, StopTheBleeding.org could be a good starting point uh, for uh, managing such bleeding issues uh, here. So certainly, I'd like to get back with you and uh, see what we can do to uh, hopefully start to initiate that, uh, that option here in, in the continent. Uh, you have some excellent uh, cases, uh, the, the endovascular options that you presented. The challenge, of course, is uh, when you are in a third world country uh, where the resources are limited, uh, you don't have access to endovascular stands when you need to. And, and uh, do you have um, ready-made stands on the shelf or you made yours? So thank you for the question. I'll be happy to help with Stop the Bleed. And so Puerto Rico, although it's part of the US, is probably the poorest territory. So we, we consider ourselves a low research envi environment. Uh, we do, I do not have a uh, stock of aortic endographs. Every time I have a case, I call it one of the companies and if they have it in stock, great. If not, they have to fly from the States. So sometimes it can be a little challenging. I try with them so they have at least one of each size in case we have an emergency. Uh, but it, it can be a challenge. In terms of uh, peripheral stents, we do have stock of the Gore uh, Biobond and BBX. So those we do have in stock at the cardiovascular center. Um, but the aortic cases, we do not have stock of any aortic grafts, either for thoracic or abdominal. It's, uh, it's a case by case basis. And in Puerto Rico, there's a, although Puerto Rico is part of the United States, the reimbursement is less for Medicare and for the insurance companies. The insurance companies actually pay less than Medicare, uh, which is the, in the States what pays the least. Uh, commercial insurance usually pays higher. So in order to be able to use those graphs in Puerto Rico, we've come to an arrangement with the companies that they will offer Puerto Rico international pricing. So the price they offer for endographs in Puerto Rico is the same they're gonna offer any in any other uh, country, any other third world country, because uh, their reimbursement is much less. Otherwise, the, co the cost of the endograft would overtake the DRG that the insurance pays the hospital. So it is, it is a challenge. What, one thing I do, I started before I was a trauma surgeon, uh, I worked with a, a colleague, is using uh, balloons for control. One of my first cases in attending was a gunshot wound to the subclavian that was being handled by another attending. He called an IR colleague. The IR colleague was not able to cross the gap, but he put up a balloon and inflated it, and he called me, listen, I need help. I'm like, leave the balloon there. I'll take the patient to the OR. I already have the proximal control, and that changed the case from a life and death emergency to almost an elective case. I was able to do an intraclavicular incision, dissect around the balloon, get my proximal control, and then deflate the balloon, pull out the catheter, and do my repair. Uh, the most stressful thing about that case to me, frankly, this was before I had any uh, endovascular training, was what to do with the, the arteriotomy, holding pressure, because I had no experience with that at that point. But even if you do not have uh, stent grafts, if you do have some catheters and some balloons, you're able to get your control and then be able to do an open procedure without, for example, and so clavians happen to open, do a sternotomy or a high thoracotomy to get your proximal control. So that's that's a beautiful thing about this. You can tailor um, your case to what you have available and what you think is best for the patients. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'll be chatting with you uh, to uh, get some uh, thinking outside the box uh, options for the African or uh, Nigerian context. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. My pleasure.
So let's spin for the top. We'll do break. One more. All right. Is that correct, Dr. Gupta? Yes, there's one more left, Dr. Mesner. Okay, let's get uh, ready. Dr. Mesner, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay, our next right. uh, speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Gregory McMaster. He's coming to us from uh, Texas, and uh, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, trained with uh, Dr. DeBakey's uh, group in uh, Texas. And uh, he is uh, also a big proponent of uh, uh, OBLs or outpatient uh, uh, surgical labs, OBLs. And um, he will be talking to us today about the value of OBLs and medical management of our patients. Dr. Matthew. Okay. Hello. We're still we're still trying to to load here. Yeah, we can hear. Think it's share. We can hear. I don't think this the screen the slide shared. It was uh, sharing. Now there's a gray uh, square <laughs> ahead of it. It was sharing. Yeah, that's, that's now it's sharing. Oh, that's got, yeah. That's so it. you could just uh, expand it, and you're good to go. Let's see. This. Just click on the slides. Yeah, the slides there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, it's just on auto share. So uh, today's talk is going to be primarily about uh, financial things and and the evolution of moving outside of the operating room to the to the cath lab where we first went because of better equipment to do minimally invasive procedures than in the U.S. to the outpatient lab or ambulatory surgery center where a lot of the care is, is delivered. Now, we're in, we're in Dallas, Texas, and so my mentor and, and my trainer was Dr. Denton Cooley and Dr. O.H. Frazier, and Dr. Cooley kind of noticed uh, towards the end of his life, I was also a transplant fellow, he would see uh, the LVAD patient sitting around in the ICU ward with black feet, and, and he would accuse us of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And so he kind of pushed me. He, he said, Greg, I think there's some things to be done with learning this needles, wires, and catheters. So during the last year of my fellowship, I actually got to spend two months of elective time with our cardiologist, uh, Swamp Go Frazier, and uh, Neil Strickman. And so this is kind of what the Texas Medical Center looked like in 1958. As you can see, the, the old St. Luke's building. And then this is what it's now. It, it, you can't tell in the back, background, that's the city of Houston. It looks the same skyscraper for skyscraper as the Texas Medical Center. So it was a good environment to train with multiple hospitals uh, right next to each other. Uh, but they really didn't compete because they all kind of pulled from their own areas. And so Dr. Cooley pushed push to always, always innovate. You know, that was his motto, modify, simplify, modify, and apply. And when we opened up the new Denton Cooley Center, we had theater rooms and 12 operating rooms purely for CV. But he pushed me to, to move out of the OR and learn to use these kind of wire skills. And so this is uh, just an observation dome. Uh, he, he loved the observation domes because that was a throwback to Johns Hopkins. And so he made him put two domes for us. We're always having kids from the schools come in and, and watch the procedures. Uh, different people come by and watch. And so we moved from there to, to now. This is this is my operating room now. Uh, it was kind of a big change when I first started doing these procedures. Um, I was doing them in the OR with the C-arm and, and it was extremely painful. And the cath lab people convinced me to move to the cath lab because we were already doing our AAA stints there to move the PV cases from there. And it was much better for us in kind of the reverse scenario of the of the uh, hybrid OR because the cath lab personnel were skilled with wire management and sheets and closure devices. And so the problem that we had to address is in the United States, PADs are a significant problem. We have really terrible diets. We don't exercise. Up to 8 million Americans suffer from PAD. One in 20 over the age of 50, and one in three is a diabetic. So we have a lot of risk factors. And of course, left untreated can lead to amputation. So up to 3.5 can have CLI. 
and each year, even in the US, we still do over 160,000 amputation and about half of those patients that undergo an amputation were not even accessed uh, with a diagnostic angiogram. Now, sometimes I go down to the Valley part of Texas to Corpus Christi and I see this over and over and over. They come with no angiogram and already amputated foot and they want us to try to improve after the fact. And so this is kind of why we, we evolved to the office-based lab. And so the beginnings of this was in the, the 2000s. Uh, in 2010, the office-based lab's accreditability was established. The OEIS was formed in 2013 and reimbursement started to affirm. And at that time, the labs expanded to about 250 in number about through the US. Well, in 2020, CMS approved PCI for the coronary. Uh, implant volumes were growing, pacemakers, and, and then we have over 700 locations and also ASC, ambulatory surgery centers have grown to about 100. And so moving beyond that, CMS continues to signal support for patients moving to the outpatient setting, whether that be OBL or ASC or hybrid model. Uh, and they're moving more and more procedures. Eventually, someday CMS may move the, the elective AAA stent to the OBL. And so the hospitals are sort of interested in this. There's opportunity for joint ventureships, partnerships, all the societies uh, support the OBL, ASC, SVS, ACC, OEIS. ASCA. And so that kind of escalated quickly. In 2019, there was only select vascular and low acuity cardiac services on the CMS procedure list that was approved. 2019, CMS approves diagnostic cath. 2020, PCI approved. 2021, they're taking on more and more complex coronary interventions from the cardiology side. But you have to realize that there's a number of, of surgeons that do these procedures. The vascular surgeons do them, the interventional radiologists do them, the cardiologists do them, and that's why I like the NCVH approach of Dr. Craig Walker, is it's a rising tide lifts all boats. We can all do these procedures, just be good at it and do it well and share, share your data. And so the market's kind of forcing in the US your hand to move more and more cardiovascular procedures outpatient. And this happened to me. Uh, I was doing two to 300 heart surgeries a year. I started doing these interventions in the cath lab and the hospital really pushed me to do, Greg, can you do more of these peripheral interventions in the cath lab? Because we actually make more money than you do in a heart surgery. And so I, at that time I was employed by the hospital. I'm like, sure, okay. And then it sort of took over my life. I didn't realize it was going to take over my case volume. And 6,000 cases later, now, you know, I've done probably 6,500 of these and then moved completely to the outpatient uh, model for the last five years. And so the payers are doing this as well. The payers like the outpatient labs because we do it more efficient. We do it cheaper uh, and, and with the same amount of safety. I can get the patient in and out for a procedure in one hour and with the use of cloak closure devices, they go home in one hour. And so the reimbursement is really sort of uh, really favoring this. And it kind of depends upon what region you live in. Texas is, is a very good for reimbursement, especially Dallas, because it's a large city. So that's very well. But I also do these cases in, in other places. My wife is from Ecuador. So I, I do these cases down there and I'm doing the same thing with teaching the surgeons. Some of them come up and spend time meet with me in my lab and I teach them. Some of them I go down there to the hospitals and train them in the hospital and then help them to move uh, to the outpatient model. And so why positions like this? It's appealing. Uh, ownership, 92% of the ASCs include physicians as the equity owners. There's the payer influence from the insurance companies and higher volumes. Time saved for procedure. When I, I can do six cases, start at 7 a.m. and be done by two because my staff turns the room much, much faster than the OR staff that get the crocodile arms after 3 p.m. and don't want to help you because it's shift change. So we turn the room over, they're motivated because the sooner they're done, the sooner they go home to their families. And so entrepreneurship has always been a thing uh, for the people that, that kind of want to move this direction. You have autonomy, you have purpose, you have flexibility with your schedule. I stopped doing uh, trauma surgery for the level one hospital. I was always getting called in the middle of the night for gunshot wounds to the heart and this and that and working with the trauma surgeons. Now my schedule is predictable. I can go give lectures and talks or go teach uh, and legacy because we want. I want to move this 
outpatient model to other places in, in Ecuador. It was easy. They're on the U.S. dollar. And we even have an Abbott, uh, an Abbott office in Quito. So the difference is there's always different regulations for every country. So the timeline, you have to make a market analysis, develop your business plan in phase one, make a pro forma, select your site. Do we own or do we rent? And then get your building going. You have the GC meetings, the plans, funding of the construction. Are you going to do it personally? Are you going to take a loan from the bank? Uh, build the timeline, develop the staff, make sure you're ready to go with your payers and get your billing and coding ready to go and all your compliance in phase three, you're ready to go. So phase one is the, the concept, the market analysis, like we said, the profunda, the forming, uh, construction costs, equipment, billing, payers, get that referral. Referrals are very important and the staffing. And then there's the building phase. Right now we're under a little bit of a crunch with the building in the U.S. due to the transporting of the materials uh, post-COVID, but there are always workarounds and there's always guys that are willing to get it done as long as it's a good contractor. And then your staffing and your managed care contracts. Now the launch phase down there, this shows the first year collections average about 3,700,000. Uh, then you go undergo like a two year expansion to where the year three, you're collecting nine, $10 million. And then, uh, you know, as you move on to 2031, you can see collections, $16 million. Uh, but the valuation of your company, if you want to turn around and sell this is worth about $50 million. And so you have lots of costs, soft costs. The, the billing and coding is the key. And you have to really watch your own supplies. Uh, I think this really helped me working in Ecuador and with Dr. Cooley, because Dr. Cooley was the same way when we did a heart surgery. You got one, one drape and you had to cut a hole in the middle of it with the scissors because he was not going to spend that much money on a drape when he was doing so many cases. And so he taught me the same thing. I tried to use one or two wires and that's it one sheet. Some of my cardiology colleagues love to use thousands of these, but it was the same thing I teach in Ecuador. We can do this with minimal cost. You don't need a lot of high-end equipment other than your C-arm. It's balloons, wires, and catheters. And so the important part of cost is cost management, uh, labor, quality of the work. You still have good quality. We do it for cheaper. We do it faster and more efficient with the same amount of safety to the hospital, and the employees are very happy. And so opportunity can come with a price. So the budget in the U.S. about one to 1.5 million to start. Equipment can cost you anywhere from three to 600,000. You have to have a service contract that's key because you cannot afford to have a C-arm down because you just shut your business down. So you have them come in and provide service or provide a temporary solution. There's staffing, management, disposables, uh, and then the ASC is the other side of the coin. I'm not going to talk too much about the ambulatory surgery center today, but although in the U.S. a lot of people are moving more and more towards this model, you can bring in multiple partners. You can bring in your orthopedic partners. You can bring in uh, general surgery partners. It kind of is a way to, uh, to fit everybody under one tent. And so the funding, there's different options. You know, there's personal funding. There's bank funding. There's uh, big companies and there's also private equity venture capital, which is something we have a lot of in the United States. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each one. Personal funding is your money and you have no equity, but you have to empty your personal funds. The bank funding can be cheap until this year, uh, time consuming or big companies. Uh, sometimes big companies come with a big price tag or they want to own a piece of your company. So you have to decide, are you going to take equity or not? Or you want to remain completely autonomous? It's just, either way is fine. It's just kind of whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. So that's all we have to say about that. This is the disclosures. And um, I'm open to any questions you might have at this time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Masner. Um, great talk. And uh, the... Uh, do you hear any questions from the from the crowd before I ask questions? Okay. And as you well know, we're transitioning from the operating room to the cath lab to the OPL because of number one is efficiency, number two, improved cost. Number three, the fact that the patients can leave early and not be stuck in the system uh, is of great value. 
what is your recommendation? I know you did talk about Ecuador for a country in Africa which does not have any proud OBL experience. How would you approach that? I think uh, Nigeria is pretty gifted with a lot of oil, oil wealth and oil money. And so a lot of these corporations love to partner and do joint ventures. And so that 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 is an option. Uh, construction, doing joint ventures with the hospital. Sometimes the way we get around some of these fundings is like in Ecuador, they have a a like a, a society from the lottery called the Junta Beneficial. And so we funnel money there to buy products because obviously they inflate the cost when they ship it out of the U.S. to get it down there. They charge you two to three times. And then sometimes when I in the beginning, I just bring it through the suitcase. But uh, getting started, you have to, like you said, pick your site, pick how you want to fund it, raise the capital and then decide, you know, who is down there with the C-arm, who can provide service if it's broken, where can we ship it from and, and, and all these sort of things. And the patients love it because they don't have the, the, the scar on the leg and the lymphedema from the FEMPOP bypass. Uh, I used to do one of those in one, two hours, but uh, they, otherwise they leave with a little seven, eight print sheath and a closure device. And so they're, they're much, much happier and they're, they're, they kind of return and return and return. And we make it like a concierge MD Anderson like uh, thing for them to see. Very good. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I we'll have one more question for you, Dr. Maybe. Dr. Bogoji. Uh, Thank you for the lecture, sir. Uh, I'm just thinking here. Uh, I want to ask, sir, uh, would you advise a young fellow who's just finished his uh, fellowship to move in straight to starting an OVO? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, would you advise a young graduate uh, from a training program who wants to go into clinical practice to start off with an OBL rather than work for the hospital system? Mm, that that depends upon the funding. Uh, sometime it might be easy to start at the hospital, get established, get a good good referral sources, and then leave the hospital and take your referral sources with you. Uh, the the first thing is to make sure you get the training. And so kind of what we found with Ecuador is it, it's kind of challenging sometimes coming to the U.S., the visa problems and travel. And so the idea of making regional centers of excellence is better because they can fly and train in one location in the country instead of coming all the way to the U.S. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Maxless. I appreciate you. I'll be in touch with you. I appreciate the ability to help us out with this conference. And uh, we'll see you in Chicago. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Well, it's that time of the evening and that time of the day. It's been quite an exciting two days of interested speakers from around the world. Um, the goal of this conference is to create a uh, generic collaboration between the practice, practice physicians from outside, outside Nigeria and physicians in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. We hope that the conference has enlightened some of us about some of the outlook for the last surgery and investing in technology and how we can apply it. I have some, some definite ideas how to improve it, but my goal is I don't have all the answers. I have ideas coming from a different planet, and I need to uh, get my ideas to learn to merge with the ideas of folks over here in Nigeria and uh, some sub Saharan Africa. We believe that uh, we're at a crossroad. We can do that. We can improve the healthcare of our patients as caring physicians, but also because we have great limitations on what we can use, we have to think outside the box. Like Dr. Mess indicated, you don't have to use four catheters or four balloons when you can use one. Uh, so being able to be quite selective will be key. And the vast of surgery requires great patient selection. If you don't, you have bad results. And the vast of surgery requires to have great judgment. And that does not come out or come by overnight. It will require training. As a, as a follow-up of this conference, which we do here, where uh, we're about to launch a new aspect using the ISEPS, the International Center for Innovative Surgery, and the Edward Beach Capacity Society and OGBMF Foundation to uh, launch a program for training for endovascular technology. 
I believe that yes, it's great to have the technology in the hospital system. Like Dr. Besson said, most Nigerians cannot afford to be treated in a big hospital setting. It's just too expensive for them. The average person that has this problem that requires intervention can be treated in the OBL setting, like Dr. Besson just said. I strongly just suggest that uh, we look into that uh, option for uh, introduction of endovascular surgery training in the country. But the complex endovascular surgery intervention, no doubt, the hospitals are needed. Like uh, was mentioned by one of the speakers, we may have to start thinking outside the box by thinking about maybe getting dedicated centers to uh, provide care. There's some great hospitals here, for example, in Lagos. How can these hospitals collaborate? Not if not one hospital can have only two, but they can collaborate three. One hospital can decide they want to be experts in stroke care. Another one decide we want to be expert in leg care, so we can lose the legs. Another one may say we want to be expert in PE management, so we can learn that from the animals. And that's how we do it. We uh, look forward to uh, making this uh, a conference a uh, yearly program and because of getting better. The fundamentals and judgment and that survey, like you mentioned, would be uh, um, improved on by, by a new uh, initiative uh, through the OBL uh, uh, section. We will start up by initially when uh, the program starts by doing a virtual, virtual uh, uh, tech, uh, training program with in uh, video uh, demonstrations. Close up short term demonstration to demonstrate the technique. And lastly, in person in patient demonstration, uh, live patient demonstration in Nigeria as as applicable. So we'll continue for just collaborations here in Nigeria. And I hope that next year we'll have a much more involved um, group of physicians. We appreciate the top speakers from all parts of the world who generously donated their time. None of the speakers, none, not even one, has been a dime of penny. They talked because they were passionate about bringing this technology, bringing the heart technologies um, and the massive technologies to our people in West Africa and Africa. So I need you all to give them a round of applause. Thank you, and I'd like to declare um, uh, conference this year, the Indivisible Conference will actually close. And if there are any pressing questions or needs, please do not hesitate to ask or call. I have my number, if you can see, a point. I don't sleep because I'm not so human, or real human, I don't know what. Yeah, yeah, so uh, so we, um, you can reach that at any point. Again, I also have to give a great and rounding applause to Duchess International Member. Thank you. Let's do a for their generosity in hosting this conference this year. We could not have done it without them, you know, so we're very close and grateful. We hope they give us an opportunity for our sixth conference next year. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for the nice I'll be in touch and then I will try to work things out and uh thanks on the Tom Boom and the way back to the back Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gupta, and all that in uh, Beckley, West Virginia. Thank you so much. You all did a fantastic job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Of course. We'll see you. See you next week. Thank you.